Brilliant, thank you so much. I hope the screen share and the sound is okay. If not, just let me know. Um, as you just said, I, I want to give a little bit of an industrial view on this technique that uh, brings us all together here, which is patient optimization. And the reason is that I come to you from the industry, aka a company called Merck, um, that we, we always start with this little interesting disclaimer here that there's actually two unaffiliated companies in this world that go by that name, Merck. And we, we do that everywhere except in the US or Canada. Um, if you are from the US or Canada, you might know us more under other names, for instance, EMD Electronics, EMD Zerono, Millipo Sigma, or just in general, EMD Group. Um, what we do in our business is quite a variety of scientific disciplines. So uh, you see here in bold a few words like healthcare, life science, business and also high-tech materials. So this is encompassing um, chemistry and material science, which brings a, quite a large uh, amount of different paths to our life in, in sort of more of a data scientific domain. And they, don't, they do not just vary from the scientific discipline, they also vary a lot from the amount of data we can work with. So, and this is why I want to start with this little view here. Um, basically in what data regime are we operating mostly? And there's of course on the right, the big and famous um, latest and greatest big data world. You know, everyone I think has heard of, of all the latest buzz going on in the uh, LLM world or um, things like uh, AlphaGo and, and these kind of works. And they happen in the big data world. That means hundreds, millions, um, hundreds of, of thousands or millions of data points or even infinite amount of data points if you think about rule-based things like games, which you can treat with reinforcement learning. On the completely other side, there are no data problems. No data problems appear if experiments are so expensive that they need to work from the scratch in your first or second try. There's no data and there will be no data in a sense uh, because it needs to work from scratch. And there we typically start with computational tools like here I brought density function theory and computational fluid dynamics as the workhorses. So as you now guess, because there's this big space here in the middle, the reality of my life is that we are actually mostly confronted with something in between, but much closer to the left. So we live in what I call the low to no data regime. So people often come to us with problems. Um, and they say, we have some data, what can you do? And then ask how much they say, yeah, big data. And it's not big data, it is tens to hundreds of data points. Or they come to you and say, we have no data or some data, but we're willing to do iterations and we're willing to experiment. Can you help us there? And that's where the, uh, of course, everyone's ears should ring because that is exactly a use case amenable to the technique we just heard about. That is, of course, Bayesian optimization. And um, actually, the majority of use cases, I think, in, in industries that produce things, uh, physical products are in the low to no data regime, which is why this technique is so great for that. So let's uh, talk a little bit about that. So what are the incumbent approaches for the low to no data regime? Of course, there is a kind of the default way, which is the human intuition or human knowledge has obvious downsides. Like what do you do if you have so many parameters or multiple targets? No human is really good at optimizing that. And you fall back into simple methods where you change one thing at a time. Um, and Humans also do these similarity or literature searches, for instance, in, in healthcare problems or so. What happens if you don't succeed in that? If there's nothing, what if your experiments just don't work? What do you do then? It often ends up in, this, in an unsystematic kind of work. Yeah. So that's not, uh, as you can guess, not really good. And so there's has been um, work that precedes Bayesian optimization, at least in the modern sense, which is this classical DOE thing. And that's really everywhere. It's a really workhorse in this uh, field. What you do there is you have a very strict planning phase where you plan your uh, parameter bounds and do measurements there and you do a subset of the possible combinations based on some mathematical criteria, which of course makes sense. And then comes your optimization phase with a model you've built. And the limitations here, I think, are also very clear. So you have to write down an explicit model. You have to model interactions. Um, it's not so easy to include prior data and also this this what you just heard about the fact that you can actually update your surrogate model is a super nice thing. It is typically not done in classical DOE. So there is a lot of downsides here or limitations if you come to complex problems. And um, that's of course why everyone now likes to use uh, this Bayesian optimization plus machine learning I also wrote because that is also an another important component there. 
because you don't need to choose your uh, surrogate model. You don't need to write it down. You don't need to know the interactions in advance. If you have that, you can include it in the model and you update it sequentially. If you have no data, you can start from clustering at DOE. You can marry actually these two techniques or you start randomly. So um, that that is sort of the mathematical foundation of it um, in, in terms of that it's a much more flexible approach than classical DOE. And because we are using machine learning at the heart of the surrogate model, it comes with a whole lot of other little additions I like to call um, that really bring this mathematical optimization technique into the real world industrial use cases. And that's what I want to talk about today a little bit. So um, we got aware of this technique and um, thought about how can we bring this to our real world use case. And there, there are some things missing in the sense that, um, as I said earlier, you can have some additions on top of the purely mathematical core. And this is why we built our own project at the time um, as, as rightfully said earlier, there's many more different codes. I just want to highlight some of the things we included because they are very important for the industrial application. We built this on Bowtorch for the uh, algorithmic sort of baseline, uh, the algorithmic functionality, and we use Atlas and Catus for uh, infrastructure. But now let's talk about some of the features that we sort of wanted to make easily available in this. And I show you some use cases, uh, examples for that. The first thing is what I call chemical encoding. Chemical encoding is a really simple idea. Take here, for instance, and there we again we are in the real world, so our optimizations are not analytical functions. They are substance or chemical reactions, mixture optimizations, where some of your categories correspond to molecules or substances, and you need to encode that so uh, so the mathematical model can use that. So on the left you see some solvents, and the traditional ways of including or encoding them for uh, machine learning applications are then uh, outlined here. So if you, for instance, do an integer encoding, you would just give each of these labels uh, or graphs or pictures, you would give them a number and then your tabular machine learning can work with that. I think the problem here is pretty obvious. So in, in the first one, if you if we integer encode them, there are some spurious distances and ordering uh, sort of implied by that. For instance, the first and the third solvent are uh, further apart in this encoded integer space than the first and the second one. While I think anyone who is, even if you're not a chemist, have never heard of the word chemistry, you can appreciate that the first and the third solvent are more similar than the first and the second one. But the ordering due to the encoding has done the opposite. That's of course bad for the algorithm. Why would you put these stones in the way of the machine learning model? And it's a similar problem for one-hot encoding. So there, there's not a spurious ordering anymore, but all of these categories now have equidistance to each other. It's a uniform distance if you encode them with vectors like uh, simple vectors like that. So I think there's very, uh, very opti uh, obvious idea to improve the problem. So the numbers we use to represent these labels should actually correspond to the chemical reality that represent these molecules. And here I brought just three examples um, of, of just descriptors that describe a molecule. And I think now you can easily see that the first and the third one are extremely similar regarding the properties. So um, that is exactly what we want. We want to Algorithm, we don't want to give the algorithm the ability to understand similar labels and not impose distances in the encoding. And so that's what this does. And we have some, some features where you can uh, do these things with very few clicks. There's, of course, many representations. I'm not going to go into detail here. But for instance, the Articate, a very common chemformatics representation is useful there. So here, a quick example on uh, what this can achieve in practice now. This is a very, very well-known data set. I think really seminal work here. By Shields et al., where uh, they have shown usefulness of patient optimization in chemistry. The nice thing about this data set is this is a reaction that happens all the time in industry, a reaction type, I should rather say. And uh, they have measured all combinations. All combinations just means you can uh, do a back test. So you can act like you're optimizing this and just look up instead of doing the actual experiment because somebody has already done that experiment. And so here's the result that we would get um, in the maximization of the yield if we use the chemical encodings from baby. And we benchmarked that, uh, we did a benchmark here against other vendors of other tools. So in this case, commercially available tools. And I also put Optuna in here as a, sort of the a very well-known baseline from the data science uh, community. So, um, and you can see it's a pretty big difference, both in the steepness or in the initial optimization and also how much, how quickly the optimum is reached. Of course, there are also other influences in this graph here. Um, we did more investigations into the role of chemical encoding. You can see, for instance, one result here on the README page of our package. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear that these 
smart encodings are extremely simple, obvious idea, but extremely powerful. And that's why we wanted to offer them easily available in, in our tool and want to use them. You can actually extend that idea pretty easily going from chemical encodings to what I call custom encodings. So what if you actually have other problems that are not small molecules or parameters that correspond to small molecules, like for instance, a polymer. Polymer uh, doesn't, it's not really, I mean, you could technically do it, but it doesn't make sense to calculate these small molecule descriptors for polymers. So you should use other values to represent them. For instance, one big thing for polymers is the glass transition temperature, which you could still uh, simply measure for your, um, for your polymers and then use them as encoding. Or on the right, I brought you another uh, example, um, postcodes. It's not the molecular chemistry world, but here, uh, postcodes in, in the UK, for instance, are not ordinal. They even contain letters. So those are labels and uh, they don't, yeah, they're not easily ordered according to what is their content. So one smart encoding could be to encode them with latitude and longitude. So the algorithm is able to understand the, the li literally the spatial distance between those centers of the postcode, which in turn could correlate with the target, which in turn could be useful in optimizing. So this general idea, we call it custom encoding. And there's another big important aspect. When you work in industry, uh, you have a lot, you have lots of uh, yeah, really well-trained and knowledgeable domain experts, but rightfully they are also skeptical of these typically black box methods, uh, or at least they see it like that. With a thing like custom encoding, you can actually enable them. You can tell, tell them, you can actually contribute here to this modeling process by telling us the right encodings. So the smart encodings for your antibodies, for your polymers, they can actually work together here with the model. And I think the results can be, uh, they can improve the result and they have role in this whole black box process, which is um, a great thing to foster the adoption. So I want to highlight one last feature. We call that transfer learning. Um, what it means is typically Bayesian optimization campaigns are separate to each other. But for instance, think about uh, chemical reactor optimization of, for instance, a Suzuki coupling. It happens all the time. And uh, why would each of the campaigns start from scratch? Can't they learn from each other as well? So if you have these similar tasks, can you combine the data as well? And here I brought you some examples that also express that idea. So what if you have optimized the reaction in a small reactor? Now you have to, like you have to transport it in a big reactor. You will find the optimum is not exactly the same. You don't need to start from scratch you should be able to use the data from the small reactor. And that's the same, a very similar idea in um, site transfer. I have a complex procedure that has to move from Germany to Brazil. Or if the vendor changes of a complex material, you find it's not working anymore. We op need to optimize again, but you want to use the data from the previous task, which was the old supplier. Or another example here for biology. So let's say we have a cell culture media optimized for a mouse liver cell. And now we want to optimize a cell culture media for a human liver cell, because these cells are probably similar, in particular for mouse and human, I think in this case, you could expect that there's already information in the previous data. So why would I do a completely naked new optimization? I want to use the old data. And so we have this uh, parameter called the task parameter, which indicates, look, it has these values, reactor one, two, and three, A, B, C. And now I want to optimize the third reactor, so which is reactor C. You can specify it like that. That means you can add data from reactor A and B, but only optimize reactor C. And here, a, a little toy example where we shown that this is effective. So the target task we want to optimize is one of these analytical test functions called the Hartmann 3D function. And um, we created some artificial source data that is now the related task. We don't know how related or whatever, but we want to create a related source task. And for that, we negate the analytical function, add some noise and sample some points from that. And what you see in the graph is how many of these source data points we add to the new campaign, to tar target campaign. And the blue curve shows you the result without any transfer learning. That is zero data added from the source task. And basically, as soon as we start adding data from the source task, it is able to understand already some information. And that, even though it's anti-correlated, so we did not pick source data from a super, like the exact same function, but an anti-correlated and noisy function. And it's able to understand that. So that's a pretty important aspect to us, um, which we included and will further investigate. There's many more of these kind of features uh, of the code, but also uh, of, of things we need in industry. For instance, one very interesting thing you could be interested in is um, custom surrogate models. If you do an active learning campaign, why would you optimize the GP? Use your already the model you want to optimize for that. You can use custom surrogates for that. 
or we have also utilities for very quick and easy backtesting with, a f with very few lines and maybe you can create plots like the ones we've shown you today. Um, this is, yeah, with this, I'm almost done. So keep in mind this work in progress. There's, and we will probably see this in this hackathon. There are so many different aspects. Try to write down here a few more. I'm really excited to see what comes out of these projects, what we can take from that. What are your suggestions and questions as well? Um, I wish every, everyone a happy hacking. So um, we have prepared some of these benchmark tools that I showed you today. So they are hosted here over at the Hacking, hacking Face space of the Acceleration Consortium. If you have questions to for these things, or if you actually want to use Baby for your project, be free to reach out to us. So again, here are some of these functions on the left. They are more suited for a simple optimization tasks. On the right, you can use them to um, yeah, test this uh, multi-context transfer learning aspect with data sets here for the source tasks, and you would optimize these tasks here on the left and this in the center. With that, I'm just left uh, to thank collaborators and coworkers. So in particular, Adrian and Alexander, they are also here in the space. Feel free to chat to them and ask us any questions. They've been involved with everything we've seen in, in the slide. And then also thanks for our supporters. And in particular, also, of course, to Sterling for organizing the event. Thank you very much.